Hello, everybody. Welcome to our broadcast today. I'm Pastor Steve Green, my wife Penny, and I pastor here at Brighton Word of Faith Church. Today's Sunday, August 8th, and the theme that we are on is winning the prize. That's how to run the race successfully, how to get to the end, to fulfill our calling, to be pleasing to the Lord, to win the prize. The title for today's message is The Simple Pattern of Sound Words. And the simple pattern of sound words is the means by which we are going to navigate the race. This pattern is going to show us step by step how to get to the finish line. We have it on a whiteboard as you can see behind us. Um, <clears throat> a couple of scriptures that we looked at last week, I want to uh, emphasize them briefly again because they're very important. In 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 3, Paul said, I fear lest by any means the, as the serpent uh, deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. This, uh, the part of that verse that we're interested in is simplicity. The gospel, uh, in spite of its breadth, the, the magnitude of the New Testament, is really a simple message that's being repeated many times and illustrated and articulated many different ways, but it is a simple message. And the second verse we're looking at with this thought is 2 Timothy 1.13, where Paul said to Timothy, hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. So this simple message is being repeated in a pattern. There's a pattern of words um, that constitute this message and so it helps simplify it. If it follows the same pattern all the time then that certainly assists us in seeing the simplicity of the message. So that is the purpose of the whiteboard. We're going to be looking at it uh, in a little more detail in a moment but uh, <clears throat> It may seem like a strange thing to to chart out the gospel, to put it on a whiteboard, but uh, every one of us has a whiteboard. Uh, the whiteboard lives in our heart. We may not have taken the time to take the inner whiteboard and express it outwardly uh, on, on a whiteboard, but it is still there. Now, all of our whiteboards may look a little different or maybe a lot different. <laughs> There's gonna be a lot of people in the world that their whiteboard is blank. They don't have the first idea what the gospel is about, and those are obviously people we wanna reach. Uh, then there are gonna be many people that have a whiteboard, but the whiteboard um, may vary very widely in appearance. There might be just a few words on it. Uh, the words may change from week to week. Uh, the, the, there may not be a, um, it may not be organized. It may not follow a particular direction. There may be, compared to the whiteboard that we have here today, there might be things that are added that perhaps shouldn't be added. There might be things subtracted that shouldn't be subtracted. Uh, there might be some of the same ideas, but they might be in a different order, in a different configuration. Uh, so so we all have a whiteboard. We all have what we believe. We all have a heart. We all have, whether it's absolutely nothing or whether it's detailed, we all um, have uh, our gospel, uh, however that looks in the moment. We all have our gospel that is uh, imprinted upon our heart. And so the, the whiteboard behind us then um, is not such a strange thing. It is simply taking uh, what everybody already has in their heart, and in this case what I have in my heart, and what I, what I understand to be the truth of the Word of God, and putting it down for the purpose of being accountable, that it can be examined, it can be critiqued, it can be studied, it can be assessed, so that I can, anybody else can um, think about this with every word we read, every verse we read in the New Testament is weigh um, the whiteboard against what we're reading in the Bible to see if it's accurate. And the point would be to uh, help all of us uh, move toward a clear and accurate understanding of the gospel, which is the simple, the the simple pattern of sound words uh, that Paul spoke of. Uh, <clears throat> it's a pattern, and, and I'm, I want to present uh, the pattern as looking like what we have on the whiteboard behind us. A few further thoughts that, we, again, what we covered last week, I want to touch on them very quickly. Again, very important, is there are a number of features about the gospel that are potentially offensive. There's a lot to love about it, a lot to like about it, but there are some uh, features of the gospel that, that might offend. Uh, could be anybody, could be me, could be
be you. And we want to, the reason I mention it is because we want to be on the alert for it. Jesus said, and we'll look at this verse in a minute, blessed are those who are not offended because of me. Uh, so Jesus understood that he was potentially offensive to people. Uh, a good, I believe, an, uh, an accurate uh, summary of the New Testament is found in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5 to 7. Not every detail, but I've compared it to framing a house. There's a much, much that isn't completed, much that isn't included yet, but it gives the size, it gives the shape. I believe that's what Jesus is doing in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew's, Matthew 5 to 7, is he is framing the house. And and in that uh, short sermon that Jesus preaches, uh, there, here's some of the key points. He says in Matthew 6, 33, and you'll recognize these, seek first the kingdom. Now that is potentially offensive. We may not want to seek it first. We might think, you know, seeking it fifth, sixth, or seventh would be, you know, good enough. Uh, so the, again, there's a place where we might stumble. Uh, part of seeking at first is seeing the simplicity of it. The simpler the gospel appears to us, by simple of course we don't mean easy, but, but simple in terms of the, the concept of it, uh, the simpler it is, the easier it is to be mindful of it, to be conscious of it, to put it first. Jesus also said in Matthew 7 and verse 5, remove the plank, first remove the plank from your own eye. There's that word first occurring again, seek first the kingdom, first remove the plank from your own eye. There's a priority to it. Uh, uh, and removing the plank from our own eye means we're constantly taking personal responsibility first. We're not pointing our finger at somebody else. We're not coming up with circumstances, reasons, excuses, um, stories to to describe you know why we haven't done what maybe we shouldn't we're not blaming it on other people we're taking personal responsibility we are uh, applying the bible to ourselves before we're applying it to anybody else again potentially offensive none of these things that we're going to look at here none of these things in the sermon on the mount that we're mentioning are human nature in fact they go opposite to human nature so the third thing is that it's going to be a narrow path, a narrow gate, a difficult path. Um, <clears throat> narrow is the gate, Jesus said in Matthew 7, 14, and difficult is the way that leads to life, and there are few who find it. So because it's a narrow path, we're constantly being funneled. The further we go along the path, the more we, we realize we have fewer and fewer options, which is a very good thing if our goal is to get to the finish line, if our goal is to win, is to get there uh, as expediently, as um, efficiently as possible, then we want to be funneled. We want to be every step to be aimed toward the finish line. But again, to be funneled, to have our, our options restricted, to be being told what to do, not to have um, the right to to come at it a different way, that is potentially offensive. A fourth point from the Sermon on the Mount is every good tree bears good fruit, Matthew 7, verse 17. And, uh, <clears throat> and so the tree, of course, is our heart. A good tree bears good fruit. A bad tree bears bad fruit. Again, there's an accountability uh, to it. There's a simplicity to it. There's not a lot of room to wiggle around. Uh, as our heart is right, it will produce right fruit. If, if there's fruit coming that isn't good fruit, then there's an issue with the heart. And again, that might be the sort of thing a person may want to sidestep. I say all of this not to say about how difficult, my point isn't how difficult this is, how opposite it is to our human nature, but we just need to be conscious of it that, that the gospel isn't going to cater to the, to the wishes of the flesh. The point of the gospel is not to cater to our flesh. The point of the gospel is to get us to the end, to the goal, to the prize, so that we are winners. Praise God. Uh, and, and so the, God doesn't apologize for it. Jesus doesn't apologize for it. Again, in Matthew 11 and verse 6, he said, Blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Uh, so he puts the responsibility. He doesn't take the responsibility on himself. Oh, I'm sorry, I might have offended you. But rather, he puts the responsibility on us. He says, you need to take this right. And if you do, then you will be blessed uh, for doing so. So that's what we need to be conscious of, is that... Um, this is not about um, 
something that is designed to please human nature. It's about, it, there's a seriousness to it. There's a discipline to it. Uh, we're, we're coming under divine discipline, but the divine discipline is a glorious place to be. It's the most enjoyable place to be. It's the most triumphant place to be. It is the most successful place to be. Successful uh, both here on earth and for eternity. Praise the Lord. That's why we want it. So that's the next question we're asking is why would we agree to this? And it's because we want life. Jesus said, uh, in Matthew 7, 14, narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. Well, we would much rather be experiencing spiritual life than spiritual death. We want the abundant life. We want our lives to be filled with good fruit. We want to be the good tree. And so we want the Lord to, to not... Um, beat around the bush. We want him to tell us as plainly and directly as possible. And of course, he's always gentle, always kind, always gracious. But we want him to tell us um, as accurately and as plainly as possible what it is that we need to be doing, which of course, that's what the gospel is about. Our mission then on earth becomes the pursuit of holiness. If our view of the gospel, if our whiteboard is correct, then, then that is the goal here on earth. That's one way of staying what the goal is. So we want to relentlessly keep our eye on the track, keep our eye on the goal. Uh, as we record this, there's Olympics that are happening in Tokyo, Japan, and it's a very, very clear thing that if you were to watch, if I was to watch any of the races on TV, uh, 100 meters, 200 meters, whatever, uh, 1500 meters, uh, the, the runners um, need, well, sorry, not 1,500. <laughs> that's, sorry, that's a different thing. The shorter races, uh, the runners need to stay in their track. In all races, regardless of how long they are, the runner needs to keep his or her eyes on the goal, the finish line. Praise God, and it's true for the gospel as well. We want to be relentless at it. So the integrity of the whiteboard, our view of the gospel, or your view of the gospel, it's essential for us to get it right. With each subtraction, uh, if there is a subtraction, something taken away that shouldn't be taken away, with each addition, something added to the mix, to the pattern that shouldn't be added, uh, with each rearrangement, if there are any rearrangements of the thoughts, the order, the sequence being changed around, the, the message is changed, it's altered, it can be so easily distorted. So we want to work hard at getting Getting a clear picture of what the right of what the right um, gospel is, and that's what we're endeavoring to do with the whiteboard. And as I say, and as I have said, it's a work in progress. Uh, if we can change it, if we can improve it, then we're certainly that's that's our first priority. Is we want to get it right. So then, uh, talking then uh, about the whiteboard and and moving to it. Uh, <clears throat> The, uh, and, and a couple of weeks ago, we covered some of these scriptures. So some of these ones at the beginning, I'll just be very quick with. But to, first of all, Christ is crucified. He is resurrected. Um, <clears throat> one thing, and I don't recall if, if I mentioned this last week, but the beginning of the gospel, the, f the first application of the gospel is that we would be saved in the first place. And so these same words apply, is that it centers around Christ and he was crucified and resurrected, what he did for us in his crucifixion and resurrection. This same Christ spoke words, words that if we believe on him, we can have everlasting life. Those words, uh, we need to have faith in those words. We're talking about getting saved in the first place right now. We're not talking about our day-to-day -day lives as they currently are, but back in the beginning, when we first accepted Christ, we needed to have faith in Him. The Holy Spirit joined with our faith. We put action to the faith in our heart by confessing Him as our Lord, and that resulted in the new birth, a new creation, our sins forgiven, washed in the blood of Jesus. Uh, and one of the words used in the Bible to describe that is we were sanctified in that moment. And so all of this then is a good picture of what happens when we first come to Christ. That being said, we then 
then move on, and, and there's no avoiding this, unless we were to confess Jesus as our Lord, then instantly die and go to heaven, then, then we're going to move on from that to our day-to-day -day life. And in our day-to-day -day life, uh, these same words apply, only now it's not how we're saved in the first place, but rather how we live by faith and how we experience the second aspect of salvation, which is the blessing of God upon those who are following Jesus in this life. And it's going to be the same basic principles, the same basic truths that constitute uh, the whiteboard. It's going to revolve around Christ, our crucified and resurrected Christ, who's our authority. He is now the authority of our life. Some scriptures about the Christ are Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, uh, which begins like this, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So G right, the very first verse of the New Testament identifies Jesus as the Christ. Jesus is the authority. He is the prophesied uh, Abrahamic seed, the prophesied Davidic seed. He's the son of promise. He's the son of covenant. Uh, and he is the one. Jesus is the one. And of course, we know that Jesus Jesus, when he was on the earth, he spoke. Just before I get to that, um, back to Christ again, Matthew 1, 21, it says, Jesus will save his people from their sins. So this is, it briefly stated, that's his mission, is to save us from our sins. And, and there's different uh, aspects to that. There's the initial aspect of, of be becoming a Christian, but then there's the ongoing day-to-day -day work that he does in our life that has the same purpose. Uh, we read in John 1.1 1, 1, that he, the Word, this, which was Jesus, the Word was made, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, so we understand Jesus Christ is God. And in John 1.14, the Word became flesh, and he dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus was full of grace and truth. Those are some scriptures talking about the, the person of the Christ. One of the key things is that he is God, not God the Father, but he is God the Son. Now Jesus spoke in John 1, 17, just a few verses after our last verse we looked at here, it says, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Uh, we read a moment ago, he was full of grace and truth, and now in his words, um, we see that grace and truth are coming out of him. And not only are grace and truth coming out of him, but there's a distinction being made uh, with the law of Moses. The law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So there's something different about Jesus. We read in Matthew 5, 21 to 22. This is one of several examples in the English Standard Version. You've heard that it was said to those, this is Jesus speaking, said, to those of old you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. And so uh, Jesus is changing the standard. He is the authority that is now upgrading the law of Moses to the necessary, um, uh, so it has the necessary quality to constitute the new covenant that he is instituting uh, and will institute in his blood. Um, the, by quality, we mean both in terms of the, the usefulness of the standard. Uh, it is much, much more um, useful to us that we would promise to not be angry with one another, say in, in vows, in marriage vows, for example, uh, rather than simply to promise that we are not going to murder each other. We kind of take that one for granted. So it's a higher standard, but it's also a higher quality because his words are a higher quality because they have grace in them. They enable the hearer to do, the, the person who hears with a heart of faith is now able to do what uh, Jesus said, and that's not true with the law of Moses. So, uh, so then continuing to read about these words of Jesus, this, the uniqueness of his words, the specialness of his words. In Galatians 3, verses 2 to 3, Paul said, This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? So works of the law or hearing of faith. He says, are you so foolish in verse 3, having begun in the spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? So the law, uh, as Paul is talking about, appeals to flesh, human effort, human strength, human initiative, no help from God, no, no uh, grace from God, no power from God. It's merely a human, it's merely a, a flesh um, ambition to fulfill the law of Moses. 
And so that would make Jesus, his words different in that um, it is now with his words, there now comes power from God operating on a whole different scale, a whole different magnitude. The words of grace and truth are superior to the words of law. This is part of what we understand from the New Testament. In John 6, 63, Jesus said, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. Uh, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. So legal words are not spirit and they're not life. The words of Jesus are spirit. They are empowered by the spirit. They have the Holy Spirit come with them and they bring life. They bring abundant life to those that follow them. Uh, in Hebrews 1, verse 1, the writer says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. So that, that's a very clear New Testament reality. And of course, in order for his words to have any personal impact on us, we need to believe in them. His words, as powerful as they are, as much as the Holy Spirit uh, wishes to join with with his words and produce uh, dramatic life-changing results for us, um, none of that happens in, if, unless we are willing to believe his words, to have faith in him, to have faith in his words, not faith in law. And this is where we see the funneling happening. It's Christ and not other authorities. It's his words and not other standards. It's faith and not law. It's the Holy Spirit and not flesh, as we just read in Galatians chapter 3. So it is, we read a good verse would be uh, Romans 10, 17 that says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God or in the New American Standard and other modern translations, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the words of Christ. All right. Okay, and to believe then is not just mental assent. It's a heart thing which involves um, an attitude. It's an ongoing attitude of heart where we continually recognize and respect the authority of Jesus. So faith is going to be taking into account that Christ signifies authority. There's going to be a, a recognition of it, a respect for the authority, and where we make adjustments accordingly. Uh, so therefore, a faithful heart, a heart with faith, a repentant heart is going to be one that is yielding, surrendering, softening, bending, uh, dying to our own agenda. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, I die daily. So the help of the Holy Spirit is also essential to our understanding of the gospel or our understanding of the pattern of sound words. Jesus said in John 14, 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things I said to you. So just as faith relates back to the words of Jesus, um, faith comes by hearing those words, the Holy Spirit also relates back to the words of Jesus because his primary function is to bring to our remembrance the words that Jesus said to us. So we can see that these are strong biblical connections, this, um, these different um, points, the sequence of these points um, are very strongly based and rooted in Scripture. Uh, <clears throat> And we also saw the connection between the Holy Spirit and the words of Jesus back in Galatians chapter 3, verses 2 to 3, which we read a moment ago. And so with the help and the strength of the Holy Spirit, then obviously we put action to his words by faith and the Holy Spirit, action to the words of Jesus. We do his words. And so the Bible calls that love. That is, a, a, that is what love in God's mind is above anything else. There are different types of love, but above anything else, Love is, is doing what the Bible tells us to do in our relationships with other people. Or a way we could say it is living, L-U-D-D, -D, living under divine discipline. Um, and, and it's a glorious place to be. Is it a disciplined place? Yes. Is it, are we being funneled? Yes. Does everybody want that? No. But it is still a glorious place to be because it's empowered. We have the help of the Holy Spirit. We can do things we otherwise couldn't do. We can perform at a much higher level. It is, a, in many ways, it's a much more pleasant place to be living in. Praise God. Uh, under, under that, we can read... Uh, well, let's just back up a tiny bit. Um, so action is love. It's also called 
obedience in the New Testament. It's called keeping His commandments. It's called righteousness. It's loving one another as He loved us, a phrase that we've used in our church uh, that I, I like a lot that fits very well in the whiteboard is we're making relational environments for discipleship. That's what doing His words is all about. It's about loving people. It's about making relational environments. It's about helping people uh, become disciples of Jesus, become better disciples of Jesus. It's about us becoming a better disciple of Jesus. All of us together uh, becoming more effective in our, in our obedience to His words. Praise the Lord in our service to Him. We read in Hebrews 11, 8, by faith, Abraham, by faith, I'm just checking if I'm blocking the camera or how much I'm blocking the camera. I think we're okay. Um, it would be a little unfortunate if, if the whole time I'm talking here you can't. I'm standing in front of the camera. Um, I don't think that's the case, maybe partly. In Hebrews 11:8, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. So that's part of what faith is, is there's a, there's a as we mentioned before, there's a dying to it. There's a, a yielding, surrendering, softening, bending. It's not according to our natural intellect. We may not understand completely why, why do I have to do this? Where is this taking me? Um, we're trusting God. We're doing some things that we would not do naturally because we're trusting God. Abraham went out not knowing where he was going. It also says it was by faith. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed. Faith will produce obedience in us because faith engages the help of the Holy Spirit and, and he very much has the job of, of making us be holy, which is the result. Uh, the result of doing his words is our heart is purified and, and we become holy. Our heart becomes holy. In our first understanding of the word holiness, well, the first understanding of our, the word holiness is what happens when we become a Christian. In, in, to, in some sense, we at that point become holy. But that, that is just the initial step. There is... Um, there's an, there is a second step of holiness, which is, which is what we're describing here on the whiteboard, which is a condition of heart, or it produces a pure heart. Uh, we read last week in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5, the purpose of the commandment, the purpose of Jesus' words is to, pr is to produce love out of a pure heart. And so we can see the Bible again. That's what we want to do, scripture after scripture. Just compare it to the whiteboard. See if this is an accurate view of what the gospel is, if this is a true indication of the pattern of sound words. Uh, we read, uh, we read in Philippians 2.12, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, this would, of course, would be obedience, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Well, in these verses, uh, there are very few uh, passages or verses in the Bible that just document each step. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, um, all in one verse. But what we, we see are the different verses um, <clears throat> presenting a sequence to us, and, and, and depending upon what the writer's trying to say in the moment, um, he might mention, you know, this point, this point, and that point. Or he might leap, uh, as we just did, saw in First Timothy 1, the purpose of the commandment is uh, love from a pure heart. So we just saw this and this and this. And so that would be perfectly fine. But what we want to be sure of is that we're not getting the uh, sequence uh, wrong or the basic steps wrong. And the way we judge that is just by co continually testing it against the Word of God. So we, we see the whiteboard is consistent with Philippians 2.12 is because salvation, um, the second aspect of salvation comes as a consequence of obedience. So that would be the, the, not again, not every detail, but that would be the, the right sequence is obedience leads to salvation. There are many that would like to think that you don't need any of this. You don't need any kind of action. You don't need any kind of love. You don't need any kind of holiness. You just have faith in God and you go immediately from faith in God, from the words and faith, you go immediately to the full range of what God has for us. And clearly what we're reading in Philippians 2.12, 
that is not the case, um, there's, there needs to be a step of obedience that ultimately leads to salvation. I'm sure you're following me. John 15, 10, Jesus said, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in his love. So Jesus said, if you keep his commandments, do his words, you will abide or live in his love. Again, uh, that would be the, the necessary sequence. In John 15, 12, he said, this is my commandment. Back to his words here again, this is my commandment that you love one another. So that would be what his words are always about. So the result of all of this is a heart that is cleansed. Uh, <clears throat> the result of this is a pure heart. Let's look at some scriptures in 1 Thessalonians 3.12. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you. So, so increase and abound in love toward one another, that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness. That would be a pure heart. So we see the sequence there. In 1 Peter 1, since you have purified your souls, uh, since you have purified, that would be your inward parts, which is referring to also your heart. Since you have purified your souls, a pure heart, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth, in obeying the truth through the Spirit, but with the help of the Holy Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, since you've done that, so now he's saying since you, you're in some degree, in some measure, you're coming into a pure heart, he says then, love one another from a pure heart. So that would be the same thing that we read that Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5, is the purpose of the commandment is love out of a pure heart. Here Peter is saying to love one another from a pure heart. So again, the sequence, the order is being affirmed. 1 Peter 1, is a good one for, sh for documenting the fact that love produces, uh, love done as a step of faith produces a pure heart, and then as our heart is more and more purified, it simply becomes easier to love other people. In the same way that when you do a job, as uh, we use the example of physical, a job that has a very um, notable physical component to it, a person first starting may not be physically built up enough to do the job so what do they do they do the job in order to get a con in order to become conditioned so that they can more easily do the job and the same is true spiritually so this is a condition of heart these are the actions that come out of the condition of heart so holiness uh, we started to say earlier is a condition of heart but holiness is also a name for the results or the love that comes from a pure heart that is also called holiness all right well, um, <clears throat> maybe I'll look at a couple more scriptures. In 1 John 1, 7, um, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, which would be doing his words, John makes that clear in the following verses, that's what he meant. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. So that's uh, what the, that's what, walking in love does is it cleanses our heart. Uh, praise the Lord. In Hebrews 5 verses 13 to 14, the writer says, for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. So here's the word right here, the word of righteousness. Uh, becoming good at walking in love is becoming skilled at the word of righteousness. Um, but solid food, verse 14, belongs to those who are a full age, that's people that are more fully developed spiritually, that is those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So by reason of use, by walking in love and walking in love and walking in love day by day, different circumstances, different expressions of love, different acts of obedience, by doing that, by reason of use, we have our uh, spiritual senses exercised uh, our heart, Jesus compared our heart to our eye, to where we can see or discern. Uh, here's one of the fruits of all of this, is the ability to see and know spiritually. Here the writer of Hebrews says that we have the ability to discern both good and evil. And so uh, the ability to really, in a, in, in, a, in a deep enough manner that it's really effective for us, the ability to tell the difference between right and wrong does not happen at the beginning of this sequence, uh, of the beginning of this pattern, but it's as we work our way through the pattern that we develop the ability to discern the difference between good and evil. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right, I'm going to just check the time here. Um, so then, 
So then with a purified heart, the result is uh, loving one another from a pure heart. Uh, and we've looked at different scriptures that document that. 1 Timothy 1.5, 1, uh, 1 Peter 1.22, and Hebrews 5.13 and 14. Uh, the clean heart, the heart that it has the ability to see, uh, that comes from, and, and the ability to see, the pardon me, the ability to discern good and evil is going to greatly enhance our ability to love other people because it becomes much clearer to us what precisely it is we're supposed to do and what it is that we're not supposed to do. All right, so there are many fruits of righteousness, and if we were to compare all of this to fireworks, um, it needs to be fired, it needs to rise up, it needs to overcome the forces of gravity, it needs to reach a pinnacle uh, represented by a pure heart, uh, and then the love that comes from a pure heart, then, then way up high in the air, the firework needs to explode or else there would be no point to it. And then there's the many bright lights and streamers and you know the theatrical display and uh, all of it. And, 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 and under the force of gravity, they fall to the earth and um, it's a lot of fun to see it. That's where the big payoff is. That's where, where the interest in it is. And, and likewise with the gospel, it's as we come to this place, here's where the explosion happens and it results in in all kinds of color and all kinds of demonstration and all kinds of wonderful things Christ being formed in us the ability to see and know spiritually as we just mentioned the fruit of the Spirit abounds in us we become effective in in helping other people making relational environments for discipleship we come to know him personally and intimately know him uh, and uh, and not the least of which involves uh, an experience of the second aspect of salvation, which is the abundant life, uh, being filled with blessing, living in His love. Um, for the sake of time and space in our outline, we um, have not documented the uh, scriptures that uh, make these results clear, but we'll do that possibly next week. The end result is God is glorified. So thank you, everybody. Thank you for uh, being part of this. So the purpose, again, of this is, is not just for us to draw pictures and talk about it, but the purpose, obviously, is that you and I both, that we would um, find a truth that is solid, reliable, dependable, accurate, simple, uh, that it's a pattern that we can easily remember, and that this would be the, uh, the that we would commit our lives to it, that we would make it, as Jesus said, make it our first priority. In order to make it our first priority, we have to be persuaded of it. It has to be clear to us. It has to be simple or, there, or there's no way we can make it our first priority. And so uh, what we want is for you to become convinced of the gospel and to give your life to it, to make it number one, your first priority, more important than anything you're doing any day of the week is you are living out the gospel and all of your necessary earthly responsibilities are best fulfilled by, in, in fact, uh, putting the gospel first. Uh, we're not ha neglecting any of our natural responsibilities by putting the gospel first. In fact, um, it is through the gospel that we are able to effectively do everything we need to do in this earth and do it with great reward both on earth and in heaven. It's called the life of God, the abundant life. It's a narrow road. It's a narrow gate. And this is what we are called to. So praise the Lord. We wish God's blessings upon you in every area of your life. Have a good day.